and it will be one of my favorite topics. But before we go there, since not everybody is watching the whole workshop, maybe we should start with a short intro of who we are and then also what we will talk about and how to find it and how you can participate. So first of all, who we are, I'm Radovan Bast. I'm with Code Refinery since 2016. It's so much fun to be part of these workshops. I work in Northern Norway doing research software engineering and support and teaching. And with me is today Jano. Hello, um, I'm a research software engineer at Aalto University in Finland. Um, and yeah, I've been teaching in Code Refinery workshops since 2019, I think. Um, so for a while. And yeah, I mean, this is a, a really important topic. So um, I have, <laughs> I can't think of anything else to introduce. So yeah, good. Is, Let's go cool. in there. So how, first of all, hopefully also you have noticed I will today teach with a headset compared to last week. Audio will be hopefully much, much better. No more echo from the room. Um, we will, how to find the material. The link is in the collaborative notes. If you go through the agenda, you can also find it there. So our plan for today, day four, this is who we are. We will talk about social coding, open software licensing. And it's really an important topic for all of us. I also like how in now in the second week, we have this mini series of different topics. And it's okay to join for just some of them if you have colleagues who would like to maybe listen to some of these topics, encourage them to sign up and participate. It's it's not a problem to listen to only to some of it. Now, how, so here you can find the material. This is the material. Now, I think I want to first tell you what this is about and then also how you can participate. There won't be any group exercises. So the team leaders, local organizers, you can relax. But we will still try to keep this really participatory. So please do participate, stay here. You can influence how this goes and I will tell you in a moment how. But first, why does it matter? Why do we talk about this? Why it matters. I like to start with this anecdote, Radovan. which is unfortunately, oh, uh, I can hear some background. Radovan, the screen needs to be a little bit more narrow to fit. Oh, thanks. Better? Okay, yeah, it's good. Great. It could be a bit wider, but. Uh, that's no problem for me. Like this. Yeah, okay. Great. Thanks for, uh, thanks for reminding. So I like to start with this anecdote and that is we don't work in isolation. Uh, when we write code, scripts, notebooks, we often start from something. We Often we don't start from the scratch. Often the first step is that we find some great code or data somewhere on the internet. It does almost what I wanted. So I, I will rather reuse it rather than starting from scratch. And I will do a little tweak here and there. We modify it a bit. We remix a bit. And then, but then it, at some point it comes, it's the time to publish half a year later, one year later, two years later, we want to publish. And then we have this realization, hmm, okay, we don't know what is the license of the code that I have reused, what is the license of the data? And the, now the best case outcome is that I still managed to somehow publish the paper, but well, I'm not sure this is even the best case, but one outcome is that maybe I can, maybe I managed to publish it without the software or without the data, but it's not very nice for other people because then they won't be able to reproduce it. Uh, I might not get as many citations, but the, the worst case outcome is that I might not be able to publish at all because these days journals require more and more that we, when the paper goes out, it also goes out with data and it goes with the, with the code. And if we have that situation, then now we need to go back in Git history and find out, oh, when we, where was this edit? What is the license? Maybe we need to remove it. It's really painful. So today, these one and a half hours, it's, this lesson is about how to avoid the situation. Does this sound anyhow familiar, Jano? Yeah, I guess more 
from um i mean people change research groups right you we, we all know that we um uh, do do a postdoc, write some code for a project, and go to another place. And um, last time we talked about, or the morning, kind of a, it may be hard to use the code written by someone else. But it's also um, if it doesn't have a clear license, and the person has left and changed jobs three times since they wrote the code, like it, it's kind of hard to track them down and ask them to provide you a license. So that's another way you can end up in the same situation. Now you have a code with no license and you can't publish it. So. Yeah. So the, our plan now is we will talk a bit about the social aspect of coding because coding is can be a really social thing. It doesn't have to be in We don't have to code in isolation. We will talk about software licensing. After that, we will take a break and then we will discuss software citation. And if we have time left, we will talk about how to share data and data licenses. And before we do that, let's talk about how you can participate. We have here a collaborative document. So although we will not have any group exercises, there will be a little, we will have discussion challenges. We want you to ask questions and comments. The more you ask questions here, really the better it is for us, the easier it is for us. It brings us closer together because if you ask questions, you can see that you can really influence this. Also, if we see questions, then it gives us a nice feeling here because then we we know that there is somebody listening, somebody finds it interesting. We don't just talk to the camera and to the microphone. So the more we see here, the better it will be. So let's keep it like a little podcast, but where people can call in and ask questions. This will be the ideal thing. And both Jano and me will watch this. And then that's the best way to participate. Um, I also liked earlier today, Enrico said that what we want is we are not striving after perfection. We want good enough. What is good enough? To give you a few, th a few things that are a good starting point. And later you can add more and later you can add more. Should we have a look? Let's start with social coding. I will go into that episode, but we keep on watching the collaborative notes. There is an interesting question there. Someone wants to give an answer to. Like, have you ever actually run into a situation where you can't distribute your code? I have, uh, which I just described. But... Yes, yes, I know the situation. It's not very nice um, if you cannot do that. And distributing can also mean distributing with yourself. So I have been also locked out out of my own code that I have written in the yeah, past because, yeah. uh, because well, it was not open source. I changed job. Now it belongs to, I don't know, a company. And then I don't yeah. have to write even right. to my own code. So it's nice if you so, can distribute code even with your future self. Most universities will allow you to distribute it with a li open license so that you and everyone else can use it. But if you don't, then it might actually belong to the university and not you depends on the university, but um, that's kind of the default. Yeah. And we will come back to that. We will come back to the question of who even is the owner of the the code that we write here in uh, in our research and in our studies. Keep the questions coming. I'm going into the first episode, social coding. And what we will do here is I will, we have a couple of questions for you where you can vote. And this will make it uh, more participatory and it will help us to keep the discussion moving. So what I will do is I will copy paste these. There's a question one, two, three, four. I will copy paste them in there and then I will share. I will share this. Copy and paste. And these questions are they give us a good starting point. So uh, question one is, if you decide to share scripts, code data, why? What is the what is the advantage? And you can vote by, you can vote like this. You add a little O next to the next to the answers that are most relevant for you. You can choose many, and then we get we get a nice 
uh, ASCII character voting here. And I will keep, so, so why would it be? Or oh, easier to find, more trustworthy, enables others to build on their code, others can submit features, others can help fixing bugs. Uh, you, you get access to tools that are free for open source tools. It may be good for your CV, et cetera, et cetera. Question two, uh, many of us are concerned. It feels it's a bit scary to put our code out there. It's unfinished, you know, it's possibly ugly. So what is the most concerning thing for you? Uh, what would prevent you sharing your code on in the open? There are some votes on my code is uh, will look ugly, which is common. Like that's a common thing people say. Yeah, let's see which uh, one will win. But I have a feeling yeah. which one might win here. So there's always the same answer that wins. This okay. question. Um, question three. Do, if do you think that software is treated differently than papers? And if so, why? Freeform. And another freeform question is, and we will come back to these questions later, uh, is when you find a repository on GitHub, GitLab, it looks like something you would like to reuse. It does almost what you want. It saves you many weeks of work. Um, what are the things that you look at uh, when you decide whether you want to use it or not? Whether you want to take it as a starting point? So please go to your keyboards, help us answering. And we will give you a minute here and then we will discuss these. In the meantime, what, what could we say? What, 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 is, what is your main motivation to share your code and data. Is there any one or two main? Maybe they are here, or maybe they are not here. Hmm. So I can say, I can answer it this I, and I will add a little O there. The CV part is important for me. It is important for me that I can show it to somebody later. I'm a little bit less motivated working on something where I know that I cannot show it to anybody ever. That is important for me. I'm actually now trying to think this is a good question. Like reproducibility, if it's a scientific code or just because these days as a research software engineer, I'm less, I, I don't have to publish papers. If, if I do something really interesting, then maybe I'll think about it. But, um, but putting the code online with a good readme and a uh, good blog post about the results is that the level of publication I would probably mm -hmm. do for a scientific result, right? Um, but then I have stuff uh, that's no in no way related to work and probably never going to be useful to anyone. And I still put them online. So I guess the main reason actually that's not in this list mm -hmm. for those is um, when my laptop dies, I can get it back um, and continue working as if nothing happened very quickly. Yeah, it should have been there. I, I do the same thing. Also for small yeah. things, I'm sure nobody will ever use it, but at least I will not lose it. And that, of course, applies to everything, or the most yeah. important work stuff as well. So reproducibility also works for you, right? Yes. You can reproduce exactly. it very quickly and continue working. Also, the C enables others to build on top of your code is really motivating for me. If, if I build something yeah. and I know that somebody else does something cool with it, it's really motivating for me. That's why I like to share. Yeah even small tools. So thanks a lot for all the answers here. Let's have a look which one, which answer one on question two. What is the most worrying thing? Ugly code, yeah, this one wins every time. The nice thing is that we all feel that way. And yeah. uh, the positive thing out of this is that maybe we shouldn't be so worried because everybody thinks their code is almost finished, just two more weeks, then I can share it, but it will never be perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect. Most people won't judge. And it will be so useful for others. And I'm, I did have this problem, right? I, I thought I would just 
get it working and then get it look nice and then publish it. But the way I got around this was basically just start well, someone's recommendation, probably go to finery, <laughs> uh, start publishing code from um, the first line uh, of code or the first file that I create for that project so that it's very clear it's unfinished. Right? And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, that's fine. The readme probably either doesn't exist or it says this doesn't work. Um, so somehow I, I got around the, uh, got over the that my code looks ugly by um, just publishing it when it's clearly not finished yet. Right. How do you communicate then? Um, do you write in the readme like this is early stage, nothing works? Uh, uh, how do you communicate to the people who find it that the status of it? Or the expectations? Um, how do you manage your expectations? In the readme, the first line in the readme or the description of the software, if it doesn't have a readme even yet. Um, so GitHub at least has a description line. So it might be an and the description might be attempt to do X or playing around with language, uh, language X, something like that. So mm -hmm. it is hopefully clear from that that it's, it's um, not a finished code. And um, I mean, I, I guess just the fact that it doesn't even stay the purpose for the software um, is probably a big red flag that this is not actually going to be fit for your purpose. Mm -hmm. um. And that's really OK. And it's OK to. I think this uh, managing expectations, communicating them, also saying that something yeah. is not maintained anymore. Like I put it out here, but I don't have time to maintain it. Use it if it's useful, but please don't be upset at me. That's also really okay. Question three, software and papers are treated differently. Thanks for the answers. Um, yeah, there is currently uh, here at, uh, in the workshop, we teach you all these different techniques and tools to make your code more usable. Unfortunately, uh, you probably don't get a medal for having the most reusable code. And it may or may not matter to the hiring committee that will decide about the next uh, permanent position. I think it's changing. So things will be different in future. I think it it can make a difference to, to have a CV portfolio where you can demonstrate that you have been contributing, developing open source software, which is used by other people, which enables other research. But the credit system is needs to adapt. Yes, credit system acknowledgement. Uh, when you find a repository that you would like to, that you're thinking about reusing, what are the things that you look at? Is there documentation? Yep, because without documentation, it will be hard. Is there any tutorial? Does it do what I thought, what I'm after? And here we are creating a nice checklist of things that we need to have in our documentation and readme, and we will come back to it tomorrow when we talk about code documentation, the quality of it, a good readme file. Uh, what, is, what is the academic background, the references? Can I actually run it? Yeah, is there a copy pasteable example and can I get it to run within in a half an hour? So it doesn't take me days to get it to run. License, thanks. That's why we are here. Because if I, we want to avoid that, that painful anecdote. So I, we also need to look at the license. Many codes will not have a license, but then maybe we need to then reach out to the author and ask, well, how about an open source license? Do you? Do you think that would be good? Code comments, easy to use. Oh yeah. When was it changed yeah. last? But without judging the person, because the, the person might not have time anymore, but yes, I will look at it. If, if it was modified last uh, 12 years ago, I expect it will be not so easy to restart. Very good answers here. Yeah, yeah, I would like to hear from other people. This is a great question. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, so I do, but like I work in a very computationally heavy field. 
And if you included code examples or a link to repositories, link to your repositories in your application, even for a scientific position like that, they don't count as papers. I um, that was in the previous question, but yeah, um, they do still count. Yeah, and and for art. And I mean, many of us will um, not maybe seek an academic position, but uh, if you then yeah apply yeah. for yeah, I mean, of course, if you're applying for, if I'm now looking at your application for a, a research software engineer position, then yeah, it, of course, yeah. it is the main thing. Then it's the main thing. Also and, for a company, like yeah. if, if I want a programming job, then they are much more interested in what code I've been working on rather than what maybe what papers I've been yeah. working on. And that's also true for, um, I mean, there are research positions outside academia, but there the code you have written may be more important than the papers you have published. Mm -hmm. So thanks a lot, everybody, for, for the answers, uh, because the very nice thing is that this allows us to basically you create a presentation for us. So many of the many of the aspects that we wanted to highlight here have been already answered. Papers and code are being treated differently. Um, with papers, we never nobody ever tries to limit the visibility of the paper because we want maximum reuse. We want everybody to use it, everybody to cite us because it will be good for us. But this, uh, uh, the incentives to share code are different, and uh, and a concern that I really have heard and I have, I understand that. Well, you know, I did all this grant work and now all the, all the other people, they get to do all the interesting science and they will get the grants and they will get the fame. Um, so we will talk about derivative work, uh, but there is a concern that if I develop something, this uh, basement and other people are building houses on top of the basement, will they even, will they even see what I did? If, this, if the thing that we developed is two levels down somewhere hidden as a dependency, will it get the credit that it deserved? And that is a valid concern. Journals are more and more requiring that data is available to, re to reproduce the, the results and also that the code is available to reproduce the results. And here we quote from two high impact journals which means that more and more we will be asked to provide the code. If I would review a paper and I see a computational paper and the code is not available, I would ask, where is the code? And then, then we need to suddenly, we need to worry about licenses. We need to worry about is this derivative work or not? And we will come back to that in, in a few minutes. And the answers that we hear on the page, you can find maybe additional answers that we thought about, we, that we thought of, but in essence, they are the document. We have, we have created them together. There is, I think, nothing really, oh, let me see whether anything was not mentioned. But these worries that we got, they are really, really frequent. What if people then ask me too many questions? Yeah, I will come back to that. Maybe for the sake of time, I wanted to highlight one uh, one point here that is about the code reusability. And we that was this question four. So what are the things that people typically look at? When was it changed modified? When was it modified last? How about, how is the versioning? Are there any open pull requests or issues? Are they followed up? Are there any install instructions? Is there an example? Is there a license? And then if I want to contribute, uh, is there a contribution guide? How do they want me to contribute? Should I fork and do my own thing? Or how do I approach the authors? And then it's also nice if there is a code of conduct because it's about trust, it's about community, it's about creating a welcoming environment. And um, I also the one like thing to- I would like to note though is we, we are talking about a relatively like a uh, high level of um of collaboration or well i'm i don't know high level of what i mean 
you can publish your code with very little effort just by putting it out somewhere and giving like the minimal things. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, to get more out of publishing the code or if it's a bigger project that you actually want other people to help with, then we are giving a lot of um, useful tips for getting it to um, to that point. But also it doesn't need to be intimidating. Um, that's, I guess, my point here. So um, you don't have to work that hard on it if you don't have the time. And we will, uh, in this session, also talk about how can we make code citable? How can we publish uh, a paper that is about your coding, about the code, not about the the application? And we will give you some hints on how that can be done. So that can be done with relatively little effort. So more about it in the session. Uh, I wanted to also say that, that when, the, when we look for these things, like when was the last change, is it abundant? This is not meant to blame anybody. We are not required to support every code we write for forever. And it's also not possible. If, if I wanted to support and maintain every single code I have ever written, at some point I would stop writing new code because all I would do is support my old code, which means that for both sides, it's good if yeah, we should be like friendly to each other and also have understanding. And if somebody doesn't answer, it's it's hard to get contributors for a project. There is this um, nice analogy in this fantastic book by Nadia Asparohova that most projects cannot retain contributors for a longer time. So interests change and it's many people who will join your project they are a little bit like casual tourists visiting New York City for a weekend. They will not be, they will not stay forever. They will maybe not be interested in influencing the, you know, local politics in New York City. And if you have any experiences with this of maybe having too many expectations on your code, please share them. It would be interesting to hear. And before we move on to the next episode, I find this point really important. Again, we don't work in isolation. So my, your work, our work, it's in this rectangle here, but our work depends on ideas and articles and data and software from other people. And how do we give back? By giving citation or you know credit for the work. And we want also our, I want my work to be treated the same way. I would like other people to take ideas from my work or other articles to cite it, software to reuse it, but then others will uh, give credit back to me, hopefully. Now, the important thing here is that others, so the, on the right side, the other people, it can be me in future. And if I want to share with others, which could be me in a different job or in a different research group, it is very important to keep track of how did I, where did I get all these ideas from? Where did I take the software, software from? Where did I get the data from? And if I don't do that properly, if I don't keep track of where did I take it, it might be difficult for me to share it with other people. And there, uh, almost everything we do is in one way or another derivative work. And software licenses matter and data licenses matter. And this will be the, the topic of the next uh, section before we go to a break. What important point did I miss here before moving on? I think this is important. So even if I, today, my repository might be private, the code might be private, and one day it will be, it will become public if I want to publish it. And it's good if already from day one, I work in a way as anticipating that one way, one day it will become public. One day I can publish it so that I don't paint myself into the corner.
there is a difference between derivative work by using ideas and derivative work as specified by copyright law. This will indeed be part of the next section here because one thing is reading a paper, understanding what they want to do and reusing somebody else's idea and then we need to cite a paper. It's a different question if we want to take somebody else's code and change it. And I guess or this is also the, the difference between what is legally covered by copyright and what is the convention in science of citing other people's work. So let's go into copyright, but please keep these questions coming. The more questions here, the more we have the impression that people are listening and find it interesting, and also the more you can influence it. So I will go into the next thing, which is software licensing. We will spend 25 minutes on it, and then we will take a break. So software licensing. Now let's really talk about copyright. Let's talk about licenses and let's keep it practical. We will not try to, we will not get too theoretical here. Let's keep things really practical. Copyright is the, that's what we are focusing here on. We will not focus about trademarks, which protect a name or a brand. We will not focus about patents, which protect a technical invention. We will here focus on copyright and they protect a creative expression. And when we write code, it's creative work. Yeah, so we are creating, we are creators mm. and software is covered by copyright practically forever. Lifetime of author and 70 years and anybody try to rerun my code 70 years after my life, good luck. So um, suddenly I'm wondering how, how universal are these actually? this law so um i assume that this is from the european union perspective but we might have some listeners from outside good comment it can it depends on the country here we will today have a bit of a us centric and eu centric legislation but we will not go it it will we will not keep it too uh, too technical either we will try to keep it practical but whether this is 70 years or not can really depend on the country. I think the more important question later will be who can, who has the of copyright? I think that's a more tricky question than how long is it valid? And that again depends on the employer and again it depends on the country, but we will give you some resources how, how you can find out. Uh, the, the one concept that we need to know about is co derivative work. And here I had, I had some fun doing some generative AI images, and I will later explain why that is also relevant in this context. In When I hear derivative work, I think of like remixing music. It's really similar, like remixing music or remixing software. It's a similar concept we are remixing the creative work of other people and creating new creative work. So I think of it this way. The, the difference is that if I'm alone at home and I want to remix records of other people, I can do almost anything I like as long as I don't distribute it. But with research software, we often don't have the choice. So yes, I can remix software and it, I can keep it on my computer and that's fine, but we are expected to distribute it at some point because at some point we are expected to publish it. And then we need to, we need to care about whether this is derivative work and we need to care about whether we, I'm, I'm allowed to do that or not. And again, reminder, it can, this is also really important if you want to make sure that you are not locked out of your own code. So this is not only about other people and be doing something good for society. This is also about doing something good for your future you. And here I have another exercise just to see what people think. So this is a exercise for all of us. You can participate here through the collaborative document. I will paste it into question five. And I want to hear what people think. There is a solution, but maybe don't look at the solution yet. Uh, 
so, and the question is, which of these situations is derivative work and which isn't? And some of these uh, might be familiar. So I find the code on a website and I download it and then I add something to it. The website could be GitHub, it could be Stack Overflow. Or you, um, I mean, basically the same thing, except you add it to your own code. So the thing changes go around the code, mm -hmm. but it does some something in your code. Yeah, one question is not here. Oh, actually, that's the second one. It's lovely. Yeah. Yes, we should yeah. also, I think one thing we should add here, if somebody feels like mm -hmm. uh, there should be a question about, I copied code from a generative AI tool and now I use it, is that okay? Is that derivative work or not? So changing your code, extending code. Now this is also interesting, completely rewriting code you got from somewhere, rewriting code to a different programming language, uh, linking to libraries and the so-called clean room design. So somebody explains you the idea, they explain you the code, but you don't see it. And then you write the code, is that derivative work? reading a paper, understanding algorithm, writing on code. That's um, the last one though, the generative AI, I guess is, well, I mean, we might get back to it. Um, is there a correct answer? I'm guessing no, right now. Yeah, I think the answer is it's complicated. Yeah. And if we have time, let's talk about also what is the licensing of these generative AI models? We can talk about the ethics of it. We can talk about the legal basis of it, but it's. I mean, most centering. of them do tell you that they publish it with some license, and then you can use it. But um, and yeah, whether it's derivative of something else is then a more complicated question. Yeah, exactly. Because where did they get the data from and yeah. the code from? And hmm. so let's see here. Oh. Uh, a is the rotative work? Yes, 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 yes. So even it might be surprising, but also that was surprising to me a few years ago. But even taking a code and rewriting everything, completely different language, it's unrecognizable. There is not a single line that is left from the original code. That is also the rotative work. I mean, in any of this, it depends, but uh, it's typically derivative work. A linking to, to libraries is typically not derivative work. So if, if my code uses something else as a plugin, as a library, as a driver, it, it is typically not derivative work. So then I'm relatively free ab about how I license my own code. Okay, that then, then brings up a question, but that may go to the licensing part a bit more, but I mean, there are there is a GPL license for libraries that specifically tells you that you can link it to it and it doesn't become derivative work. Mm -hmm. But if you don't use that license, then it doesn't specifically tell you that. So I'm wondering if uh, that actually makes a difference now. Mm -hmm. I, would, I mean, I would have voted yes for this one because just because I know that those licenses exist. Good, so we have some solutions here. Oh, I'm in the wrong episode. episode. Here we are. So we have some solutions, uh, but linking to library is typically not derivative work. Also, if I read a paper, I understand the algorithm. The algorithm is not covered by copyright. I write my own code. This is not derivative work. And why did we ask it? So why do we spend time here on derivative work? Why is it so important? It is important because now that I want to share my, res my, com my code, my script, my notebook, which very often is derivative work, now I need to see what was the license of the thing that I have derived from. And if I want to make my code available, for reuse, then I need to choose a license that is compatible with the license of the original thing. And here's a nice overview of different so-called 
Um, so there are different classes of licenses. In this overview, there are software licenses, also data licenses. And the errors between these are compatibility. Uh, it is not our goal here to go through them in detail or for you to remember them. But when you, when you code, you might see somebody talking about the MIT license or BSD license or GPL license. They, what is the difference between, in terms of like the bigger picture, uh, how do, why is this dark green and this is here, or light green? What is the difference here? Do you want to comment on it? Should I comment on it, Diano? Mm. Well, I mean, I can explain it if uh, I'll try to, but um, I don't have any very deep copy, uh, comments. Right? So, um, I mean, strong copyleft is kind of less easy to use in your own work. If you use it, then you are restricted to using a copyleft, a strong copyleft license. So it is more restrictive. Um, and if you go down to um, copyleft, we copyleft and permissive, well, in permissive ones, you are basically free to use as long as you give a citation or that is to say, provide the um, license for the code that you reused and attrib give attribution. So tell people who actually wrote it. Yeah. Um, so it's very uh, permissive. And it's permissive in a sense that you can do with it almost anything uh, as long as you credit the original authors, you might need to have to state what changes did you do. And we will later give you some practical tips on how to do that in practice. But, but then if I want to, well, you can even incorporate it into proprietary code. So this, this red triangle here are proprietary licenses. You don't have to share the result. Now we are in the, Many of us, most of us are in the academic world where we are at some point expected to publish our results. But if in the uh, private world, uh, most companies don't want to do that. And then, so this is this red arrow, it's compatible. Then there is this strong copy left. And then there are licenses that are somewhere in between. And the somewhere in between means that you uh, if I take it and I improve it, I have to change the, I have to publish the improvement, but I don't have to publish everything. I only, I, I only have to publish what I have changed and other people can in include that into their projects. So there is this strong copy left. Some, sometimes this is called share alike and the permissive, and then there is something in between. And now we will not tell you which of the license is the best, because that really depends on what you want to achieve. Um, if you want, what we will insist, however, on is to recommend you that take one of these licenses, because they are standard, people know them, people know their compatibility. So we will later recommend to not invent your own license, but take one of these licenses that is best to your intent. Good. Oh, uh, yeah, there are also some data licenses here. So Creative Commons, there is Creative Commons Zero, Creative Commons Attribution. Uh, one difference between software licenses and data licenses is that in the, among the data licenses, there are licenses that prevent you from making modifications, which is the non-derivative. There are also licenses that prevent you from making this commercial. So in, in the data world, we have these non-commercial licenses and non-derivative. This doesn't really exist in the software licenses world because the software we, a software without making a derivative of it doesn't make so much sense because then, I don't know, we, if you want to reuse software, you always make changes to it. Otherwise you can just download it. So that's the difference. There are some great resources. So you don't have to remember that, but what one resource that I really like, and it comes from this European Union, uh, sorry, European Commission is this licensing assistant. Maybe I can open it up here and we can have a look. 
because you get a really very clearly not legalese but clear english is explained what i'm allowed to do what i'm obliged to do for the many different licenses and then if i look here for i want to know mit license how did that work again what can i do what can i not do gpl mit here then i can read up and i can even compare licenses if i want to have a comparison what is the difference between mit and and mm, bsd then you can compare licenses i really like this resource because it there is not a company behind it here let's compare these two compare and then i get a nice comparison and see that aha uh -huh, there is a little difference here and there is a and that's it otherwise they are very similar oops oh, i didn't want to click there if there is also a nice compatibility checker if you want to know whether some license is, is compatible with another license you can use this checker that they provide this is really nice we also have a slide deck which we will not go through but where we try to explain software licensing with the analogy of explained with cakes with a cake recipe so you can you can go through it uh, at your own time and since we got a really good question here and probably we went too fast could you again mention which kind of licenses is often used in an academic context so let's go back to that and let's think in terms of academic context so how about which licenses do you see most often, Jano, and which one do you use? And I could also comment on that. I see MIT and BSD a lot. Um, that kind of is, yeah. well, similar to uh, publishing a paper in the sense that um, you are culturally required to cite it, but it's not legally, um, like that. there is no legal requirement for that. Um, well, actually, there is a legal requirement in MIT and BSD to to mention your to to attribute so to give your name right um, in your code. Yeah. Um, I don't really see the others so much. I mean, GPL is of course very common because it, I mean it, it's it's famous. Um, so I see it occasionally in academic work as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you want to make it as easy as possible for everybody, oh, it's BSD or MIT. This MIT is the most popular license. Um, I, for little projects, I, I use MIT. For my other favorite license is the EUPL, so the European Union Public License. It, because it's very compatible with lots of licenses, there is the European Commission behind it. And the difference between MIT and the EUPL is that it's share alike. So if somebody takes my code and makes improvements to it, they have to publish the improvements. And then I can use the improvements again. And I think that's nice, that's fair. I want to be able to, like if I show something, I want also to use the thing that people improve there. So I personally yeah. uh, choose between these two. Good. We will take a break in five minutes. Now, let me just think here, how do we use the five minutes before the break in the most useful way? Um, <laughs> here is a, you can try that later, some questions on typical situations and what that means. In the remaining five minutes before the break, I would like to comment on some really important practical questions. So one practical question, okay, we there are licenses, when should I edit? And then later, how do I edit? When to edit as early as possible, because it's at the beginning of a project, it's easy. Later, it's not so easy. And then it's not so easy because later there are more people, there are more organizations and it becomes complicated. And you don't have to open source your code at the beginning, you can you can already choose a license and then you open it up as when you once you publish 
and you don't have to even open everything. You just you you can open up the part that you have published, and all the secret unpublished stuff can be on a private branch, and you can open it up later. But again, this reminder: it is useful to work as if the code is public, even though it is still private. It will save you many tears down the road. And now, how to how to add a license? Uh, now you need to decide, well, now you need to find out, is this derivative work or not? And if it is derivative work, here we have a couple of really step-by-step -step recommendations um, on what to do. If it is derivative work, you need to find out what was the license of the original work. Maybe there is no license, maybe you need to contact the author and ask them. And then you need to find one that is compatible. Um, and then it depends, maybe you want to incorporate something into your own project. And then here we have some steps. And you don't have to do all of these steps. This is, again, try to, you know, good enough. Uh, so the, the perfection should not be the enemy of good enough. Uh, but we, the other situation that you might have is that you have an existing project and you want to change it. So you don't want to incorporate something into your project, but you want to take something existing and improve it, modify it. And then here we have some recommendations on what to do. In this case, fork the project, check the license. Well, first check the license, then fork the project, list what changes did you do, and take a compatible license. If you have started from scratch, and your work is not derivative work, then you don't have to think about compatibility, but you still might need to answer these questions. Uh, you might need to check with your supervisor. What does the grant say? What does the collaboration agreement say? Is there any intent to commercialize the code? Who are the owners? And then, among the people who own the code, then you can decide, but don't design something new, take an existing license because then compatibility is clear. And once you have, uh, once you have decided, then here are again some practical steps. For small projects, you, you add a license file and then on top of each file, you can add this copyright header. Good. And here we have lots of lots of resources to read more. So we know that this was a, really a quick tour, uh, but it's it's one of the only really practical places that I know of that really collects all of this in one place. Do we have time for this question before the break? I think we do. Is is the EU public license the only license with share alike? No, it is. Scrolling up here. A very so the lesser GPL and Mozilla public license they are very similar. They are weak, copyleft, and then if you want to go more copyleft, it's the GNU public license or the Affero GNU public license. So all of these would be share alike licenses. So the thing that EUPL adds is the reciprocal reciprocal difference. Anyway, um that if you make an improvement or change, you need to publish it. Is that correct? Yeah. I should have formulated that as a, que as a question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it's it goes both ways. The recipro yeah. reciprocity means that sharing goes both ways. Yeah. So um, LGPL and uh, the Mozilla Public License don't have that. So that's the, why they're in a different class here. Uh, so also there you need to share back modifications, but not everything, but the modifications you need yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, right. So not the whole thing. Yeah. So I recommend we let it all sediment a little bit in our heads. Let's take a break, uh, let's take a break, 10 minutes break until six minutes past the hour. And then we can take any questions that came up and we will move on to software citation and publishing, software publication. So break until six minutes past the hour and see you then. Thanks.
Hello, so we are back from the break. Uh, there's a couple of interesting questions. Um, first, let's see. So, so let's say 27. Um, so when is rewriting code derivative work? Um, we did have that in the exercise as an example, but we didn't actually address um, when. So, I mean, we said it's complicated. We didn't actually go into more detail. So can you, um, is there an answer? So let's see the answers here, but I would say that the yes, oh, when I rewrite code, I have created derivative work. So because I have used the code, I have looked at it, I often I use it for my test cases and I use it to compare the new code and the old code. And it's often a process. It's not that at least I don't like read the old code and then I go into seclusion and write the new code. I, I often then, both have I have both side by side, and then the thing that I came up with then is a uh, is derivative work in my understanding. Uh, one way to prevent it, and this is something that probably in academia probably nobody will ever do, but it's it's employed in in the private sector is this clean room design. So then I have never seen the original code. I have only seen the algorithm. Somebody explained me the functionality, and I went on and developed it, and then it's not. Um. Okay, so basically, um, if you are using the code as more than a description of the algorithm, then it is derivative work. Yep. Yeah. But also, as the one answer indicates, that for most of what we do, I mean, we will. Uh, this will not be a court case. We don't have to be worried. Uh, it's yeah, just yeah. about doing the like ethically and academically the writing. Yeah. We want to give credit to people. We want to use their code in the how they intended it to be used. So it's, um, it's, about, it's about that. To that effect, actually, question number 26 seems interesting. So, I mean, so the question is, is there a way of like, protecting the code from bad modifications, harmful modifications? Um, mm -hmm. So I guess there's a couple of cases here. So first of all, if, if you are maintaining the project yourself, you will accept the changes that you accept and you will do not have to accept the change that you don't want to accept mm -hmm. uh, in the code that you're maintaining. But then if you publish it under a very permissive license and someone just makes a copy and changes the name enough, first of all, that it's like not infringing on um, on your trademark, basically, or like it doesn't sound like it's the same code, and but then they make a new one that has some changes that you would consider harmful. Um, I guess there is... Uh, MIT license doesn't exactly protect you from it, but there is the trademark um, as a separate thing. Yeah, so when I see this question, which is a very good question, I, I see several things here. One thing is, oh, in in academia, we are concerned about reputation. So one thing is the reputation. And, uh, and maybe this was meant there or not, but of course, we are worried that if somebody takes the code, makes some modifications that will it harm my, my reputation if somebody publishes something really weird with it. And I think this risk in reality, in reality, it will be clear what is your code and it will be very clear what is the fork. I don't think in, I don't think in practice there will be confusion about what was your and what is somebody else's. But I understand the worry. The other thing that I can see in this question is that what if somebody takes my code and uses it for something unethical? Uh, building weapons and, you know, doing some harmful AI. And uh, that's that's a much bigger topic. And the standard licenses that we have discussed here, they will not protect me from it because they they are designed in a way that people can do any modifications to the code because it 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 wants to provide this freedom of uh, applying modifications and not restrict other people. If I wanted to really restrict, so how would I restrict the the modifications? Hmm. There are so called I mean, there are licenses that focus on the ethical aspect. I wonder we, whether we have listed them mm -hmm. somewhere. I think we have some resources, at least links to them. 
but they are not very uh, I mean not many people use them also they will maybe not even prevent it so I don't have a good answer but these are the two worries that I see in this question mm. I mean, something that in principle, at least like, I mean, the licenses are legal things. So it, it might legally, re the license might legally require the uh, user, the, the one to make the modification, to publish their modification. Um, and then you might think that it restricts use, for example, for weapons. But in practice, I'm not really expecting most militaries to publish the code anyway, <laughs> if the, even if the license requires it. So... Um, I mean, and there may be legal ways for them to, I mean, they may be, may be able to legally not publish the code, even if the license is in. Um, Richard, who is here with us in the background in the studio, might have a comment on the on the questions about the ethics. So that would be nice to hear. Yeah, uh, let's see. There was, yeah, this came up in one of our chats sort of recently. So. Like, is there a license that says, okay, you can only do ethical things, but that's difficult because how do you define what's ethical? So when you look at some open source and free software guidelines, it basically says it shouldn't discriminate against field of use because then you get some things like this can't be used for anything that does genetic modifications. This can't be used for weapons research and so on. And there become so many different limitations that you can't really, like, it's not considered free software by the common definitions anymore, which might be okay if that's the point. But also, if the software itself has any special relation to these things, maybe you shouldn't be releasing it at all. And if you do release it and the license says, don't do this, well, anyone that has enough resources to do it, use it badly, would just rewrite it from scratch by looking at your thing and not tell anyone. So it doesn't really, it only helps, good, it only hurts good people and doesn't hurt bad people. So mm -hmm. in short, I'd say don't worry about that. Yeah. Thanks a lot for this comment, Richard. We have 15 minutes left. I wanted to do, before we go into citation, I think because we talked a lot about legal aspects and there is a risk that it gets a little bit theoretical, I wanted to show you an actual example. And these are two codes that I'm working on. They are not perfect. So don't look closely, too closely at all the things here, but I, w I wanted to show you two projects that I have on GitHub. And what is it that, uh, so how about the licenses? In this project, I have a folder called licenses. And in there, because I anticipate that this will maybe be a mixed project where I incorporate things from different places, and then I can list all the licenses here. And in the readme, I will then summarize what were the modifications that I did. And here I have another project. And again, there are lots of files, but there is this file license. And this is often all it takes to add this file. As, as long as you have this file on GitHub, Git will, GitHub will also actually read this file and it will see that this is a Mozilla public license. And if I'm not sure anymore, what does that mean? I can click on this. And it not only shows me the license text, it also gives me a summary of permissions, limitations, conditions. The other interesting file here, and this is already a preview to the next episode, is this citation CFF. And you can see that there is now also cite this repository. So now I made it a little bit easier for people to cite this code. And how do we do that? How do we do it in practice? And that's what, what we will do now in the remaining 15 minutes. So I will move on to the next episode, next. And, and I will start with a question to all of us and well, to Jano and me because now we know how to put our code on GitHub. We did that last week and we add a license to it and it's it's there, it's reusable. Is that enough? And and yeah, it's probably good enough, but can we go can we go a step further? 
So is it enough to make the code public for the code to remain findable and accessible in the in the spirit of fair principles? Question to Jano and me. Yeah, I mean, just because we are asking the question, you can already guess that the answer is no, but then what can we do? So, so what can go wrong? Um, what can I think of? Um, yeah, GitHub might not, not, might not exist 10 years from now. That's that, that's true. Um, something might happen to just make your code directly unavailable. Another thing is dependencies. Um, the libraries that you use may change or and um, the versions that specifically you used um, if you wrote them down, um, they might not be available 10 years from now. In, in fact, they are likely not to be available 10 years from now. Yeah, and um, I might uh, accidentally delete my GitHub repository or yeah. I become disgruntled and I delete my GitHub account and then the code is gone. Um, so the what we what we want to talk about in the episode are actually two things. One thing is, and they can we can do both in one step. It's about making things citable and persistent. And citable is so that you can get more credit. And at some point we can put on the CV that this software has 130 citations. I think it's also fun to see who is citing you because it can be fun to see where is my code even used. It can be a good starting point for new collaborations. So one part is the citable, but the other part is persistent, meaning that it will not just disappear accidentally. It will be persistent. There is a persistent identifier. And in the same way that we can get a DOI, a digital object identifier to papers, we can get digital object identifier to data and to software. And we will mention some of the services that you can use for this. But maybe the most popular service for software is Zenodo. Zenodo is uh, backed by CERN. It's it's a non-profit publicly funded service that is hosting code and output of the you know the particle accelerator in CERN. So at least for the duration of CERN, this thing will not disappear from the internet. It's one of currently one of the best places to place your code and be reasonably sure that it will still be there in 10 or 20 years. So how do we do this in practice? How do we make our code citable? Where can we publish it? Are there, are there papers that focus on, on code publications? This is what we want to talk about now in the, in the last 10 minutes. Here we have a little checklist of what are good things to have there. License, now we know that. Uh, there are a few more things. We want to make sure that we credit everybody who contributed, that there is a clear version number. Um, and then recommended citation. Uh, people will cite me if I make it easy for them. So every project should have a recommended citation. How do you want to be cited? And then people will do it. Uh, and you you have a persistent identifier. A nice way to do all of these things is, uh, so there is a file format called citation file format, CFF. And you can, there is a link to an example for a project. And this is how such a file looks. So it has some metadata about who are the authors. They can, with their ORCID number, um, and this metadata uh, is then used by services like GitHub and it will then show uh, you can cite this software this way and that way. This can also then help to measure which software depends on which and uh, measure citations. And then I mentioned this uh, project uh, oh, so sorry, this service called Zenodo, where you can then deposit your code and get a, make it citable, get a DOI for your code. And we also link here to a step-by-step -step recipe on how you can connect. So if your project is on GitHub, you can connect it with Zenodo, and then you can get a new DOI basically with a mouse click. So every time you create a new release on GitHub, it will create a new DOI. 
but the bottom line is make it as easy as possible clearly say what you want cited and i mean people are nice they will do it if it's difficult for them to figure it out they might then postpone it and not cite it and this is now supported by github it's supported by lots of other services we also link here to some tools that can help you to create this file or to validate it and then you can so add this to your project and you already make it a little bit easier to for everybody else can you also cite other part oh well you have a citation file and um i think you can also cite other projects in the citation file right um for your from your software and how far should i go should i cite i mean uh, my project has dependencies and the dependencies have other dependencies so how far do we need to go when we acknowledge other people's work if you know there are different layers of dependencies and i can also answer that i just wanted to show you that i can also follow this so here i'm on the zenodo here is this code that i have written with other people and it it is here on the internet i have no way of removing it from the internet and i think that's a very nice thing i can be sure that it can be findable and accessible and about the dependencies so the the recommendation is to when i want to acknowledge dependencies and cite them i cite the direct dependencies of my code i don't need to acknowledge their dependencies and their dependencies so we we go one level uh, uh below but not multiple levels it might be not practical but then we need to hope that uh, the code that i'm acknowledging is acknowledging other people and their dependencies and hopefully they also get the credit and hopefully they get the jobs yes Ooh, five minutes left let's not forget feedback but i will scroll down here so there are papers that focus on scientific software because nowadays it is clear to many people that code is a valid academic output and sometimes you want to publish a paper that really focuses on your code and here is a nice overview of different journals that focus on this we also have a collection of resources that give recommendations on how to cite software that you use and here are some resources but uh, really the thing that we sh that should be there are the creator the title the where was it published and so this can this can be a good starting point what should we do in the remaining five minutes any questions um, coming? should we move, talk about data about the feedback i think um yeah i think we shouldn't completely skip the data section we also already talked about zenodo though so that's a good place to to put your data and well is there anything any huge difference between data and software um that we need to bring up yeah well like the biggest difference is like the just... size often it's the the software it's something that fits into a good repository data maybe not Let's so your data share. is probably not on github but you can still put it on zenodo in most cases it's up to 50 gigabytes yeah and i think if you ask nicely you can get more uh, so there is another there are other services uh, open science framework i hear often so here we link to services that we know about i'm sure this is not a complete list so if there is a service in your community and in your academic domain that is really popular please send us a pull request uh, some of these services are focusing so in different countries there are also different popular services and we listed the ones that we know about in Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland. So please help us complete this list. Um, here we also have more resources about the, the licensing for data, about the legal aspects of data sets, databases, some resources about how does it work with machine learning AI models? Is that data? Is that software? How does that work? Here are the resources that we know about and a lot more further reading. So I hope this will be helpful. I know this is really, um, this is like looking at something from 10 kilometers altitude, but we wanted to give you a starting point. Um, 
maybe the one thing that I can uh, not forget to say is that it's nice if I publish the paper and the data and the code, each three at some point should have a DOI. They should each, each three of these should be citable. And it's nice if they cite each other. So if I find a code, I can, I also have a way to find the data and the paper and vice versa. So we form this nice triangle of data code paper that cite each other. We have here the feedback form. We have only three minutes left. Please let us know about how today went in terms of speed, in terms of the level, in terms of the exercises. Now we know that in the last session today, it was, we didn't have any group exercises. It's a little bit difficult to do with licensing, but tomorrow we'll be back to really do hands-on in both parts of the day. Let us know about one thing that you particularly enjoyed and one thing that we should change improve, remove, delete, change. And the thing that we can fix already this week, we will try to fix already this week. Any other comments are welcome. And to give a preview of what to expect tomorrow, tomorrow we will talk about documentation. Again, one of my favorite topics. Documentation and Jupyter Notebooks. I think these lessons will go nicely hand in hand. I'm really looking forward to that. What did I forget? Oh yeah, um, we should add this one. Good point. Yeah, there are there are different places for publishing different domain data. So um, like machine learning models, hugging face is a, is one good place, and there's multiple repositories, of course, that you can use. Yeah. And hacking space is also for the code that runs and produces the model. Mm. So this was a brief overview. The The take home message is not to be scared to share. I, I hope that the effect is the opposite. I hope the effect is that we let's share, let's put it out there. Let's choose a license. Let's do it early. Um, and in this material, mm. you will find what are the first steps, what are then the follow up steps Add a license file, Add a readme file. Write how you want to be acknowledged. Write how you want contributors to contribute. It will take time until people find your code and cite it, but it it's a nice moment when you know one day in a few months, somebody will just send you a pull request and fix a bug or tell you that they it really unlocked something new for them and they could do some interesting science with it. I think this is really uh, motivating. Any questions that we didn't give you enough attention to? Thanks a lot to everybody who helped answering. I tried to answer the ChatGPT question, code generated by ChatGPT, what's the license? Um, but it is really an open question right now. It, it, it is an evolving thing. So um, it's kind of something that you shouldn't be too scared about, but um, also the reality is that it might change um, as the uh, the legal framework gets developed and court cases happen. Um, so right now, though, the situation seems to be that um, code generated by ChatGPT or any other LLM um, directly is not copyright copyrighted by anyone because it did it wasn't produced by anyone that's kind of their thinking um but um you need to be careful about the possibility that there is something um that it produces code that is copyrighted by someone because that it is in the training data yeah. that's one one potential problem mm -hmm. So thanks so much for the feedback also for the what to improve. And we really appreciate also the feedback that today, yeah, there was not so much benefit being in a group because for the last two hours, like when we speak here, you can't do anything, you can't discuss, and we are aware of it. Maybe we should move this lesson to the end of the workshop, but we, we really think and know that this lesson is important. It's important to talk about it. On the positive news, uh, tomorrow we are back to 
lots of exercises. So there will be at least two exercises in the morning. In the first session, there will be two exercises in the afternoon session. So please don't disband your groups yet. Tomorrow we will do hands-on work. Really looking forward to tomorrow. Thanks for today. Thanks for listening. Thanks everybody for helping. And tomorrow, same channel, same usual time, talking about documentation and then notebooks. Back to the studio. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone.